the fire of God that sets our heart ablaze, isn't it? I'm telling you, that's what we're praying for too, that it would be God's fire. Look at, you, look at your neighbor and say, no false fire. Yeah, we don't want any false fire, right? Man, we people, we're experts at starting false fires. Yeah, right. Yeah, false fire never warmed anybody, did it? It might look good, but painted flame doesn't, doesn't warm anybody. So we don't want any of that painted flame stuff. A lot of, a lot of ministry, a lot of uh, movements are, are really just uh, uh, another brand of painted fire. And who wants phony fire? Phony fire gives no light and phony fire gives no heat. Hmm. Looks good. Looks good. Everybody can be impressed. And, oh, wow. That's gorgeous. That's beautiful. But when the real thing comes along, it just basically has no power and no strength. So who wants phony stuff? Look, look at your neighbor and say, give me the real thing. Okay, give me the real thing. Okay, well, there you go. All right. Just wanted to know if that's what we were talking about today. <laughs> I'm tell you, the book of Revelation is the real thing. And uh, my, my idea about the book for you is not to, be, not to do in, intently provocative things because you can, really. You know, this whole study of the book of Revelation can become completely provocative. By that, I mean to try to provoke you to whatever mentality I would really want you to have. Uh, I, my intent is not to be unintentionally provocative because I, I'm, I'm sure I could uh, easily take this into political realms and just blow this whole house up, you know, with my thoughts about politics and so forth. Now, are we going to see things that are political? I'm sure we will because the book is about rulers and kingdoms and, and provisions and, and movements, and, you know, it's all about what's happening today. And, and you're going to see those things. And the only thing I can say to you is no matter what you think I'm talking about, somebody besides you is probably thinking the exact opposite from you, okay? Well, I know sometimes you'll be like, oh, I know what he's talking about. And the person beside you will be saying the same thing, and it'll be two exactly opposite directions. I'm serious. And I try to keep things this way because... It's not my intention. I'm not up here as a political commentator. I'm up here as a man of God trying to teach the Word of God led by the Spirit of God and let the Spirit speak to you about what the truth is about anything that is done. So if you, you know, have the bent to think, oh, Pastor, he's trying to, t you know, well, you listen to the Spirit of God, and I'm going to try to keep my personal thoughts about everything out of as much as possible to keep it mysterious for you, not because I want to be elusive, but because uh, the enemy would divide us. The enemy's attempt would be, okay, let's stop these people from being blessed. And how do we stop these people from being blessed? Well, let's cause division among them. Let's cause divisiveness. And that way, no one gets blessed because everybody jumps to conclusions that aren't there, and the enemy has divided the kingdom of God once again so that we choose sides instead of uh, hearing what the Spirit has to say to us. So I'm just encouraging you in that. And, and, and I know that along the way, uh, you know, some, somehow we'll have to keep saying things like this because we're all humans, right? Look, look at your neighbor and, and see if they look like a human. Do, you know, if they, if they look like one, you see, okay, they got skin, all that. Okay. I just wonder, you know, I just you want to make sure that they're humans, all right, because that's... That's what we're after. All right, let's turn to the book of Revelation. Uh, I know you don't have your Bible. Many of you don't have like a book with you. There are books with pages in it and all of that. We, we used to carry to church. We called it a, the Bible, uh, a book. It actually has pages. There's one, and there's one. There's some relics from the past. Yeah, there, there's one, and there's one. Yeah, all right, good. Hey, four, five, eight, or ten of you in here have... The others of you are looking at a little screen on a phone or something or another, and it's, yeah, right, you got one of those too. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, there's one. And, uh, and I know everything I say that, a lot, you know, some of you, you're going to be checking me out, I know, and uh, so I try to write you some notes. By the way, have we, got it, have we gotten it um, settled how people that are watching us can get these notes? We haven't gotten that settled. If they sent, if they sent a request to Facebook and said, hey, can you send me the notes, we could send... 
We could send a file. So, okay, you guys on Facebook, if you're watching this until we get it where you can, you can click an icon and get these things downloaded, these notes that I get at, give out to you on Sundays are an effort on my part not to preach the sermon in the notes. It is to give you tidbits of information that I think are important so that next week or two months from now or whenever you look at them again, you could follow those notes and have a general flow of what was said. In other words, I'm trying. what I'm giving to you is what I think I would want to write down if I was listening to me talk about these things. All right, so you can write other things. You have plenty of margin and all that other kind of stuff. And there may be other things you may be more interested in than something I say, but these are the things that I think you need to have to keep the flow going of what this means because right now we're just starting into it and you, you know, it's all fresh and it's all everything. But believe me, a few chapters from now, you're going to have some intermingling and it's going to kind of get a little uh, dicey on some of the stuff if you really don't grasp and understand what's going on. You can understand it. Look at your neighbor and say, you can understand this. All right, now you don't have to say this to your neighbor, but I want to say it to you. God wants you to understand this. This is written so you can understand this. God did not write this book in mysterious ways so that it would confuse you. God wrote the book according to his own testimony. It's called the revelation. It's called the unveiling or the, the opening of understanding. So it, God intended for you to understand, not to bring, you know, there, there's this erroneous thought in, in some of you that have studied the book through the years or you've been around a long, long time like me and you looked at it in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or whatever, whenever you may have looked at the book of Revelation, probably in some Bible study along with a whole bunch of other Christians, you know, back in the 70s, you know, we had certain things, 80s, and, and the reason I know this is because I've been doing it since then, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I know I look like I'm pretty young, but, but I, I, I have been around a little while. But, uh, you know, uh, there, there have been erroneous, and, and erroneous thoughts, and I've heard this even back then when we were doing it, that God wrote this book that inspired John. John was actually the author that penned everything down, but obviously the book itself says that Jesus is the one who is talking in John's ear and saying, write these things down. These thi th this is not the writings of John. This is not the writings of the Holy Spirit. This is the writings of Jesus Christ himself talking to John and saying, write these things down. It would be as if I stood right here with Wesley and I said, Wesley, write these things down. And then I'm dictating what he's to write down. That's what the book of Revelation says this book is. It is the dictation of Jesus Christ so that John, the old man on the Isle of Patmos, is writing down exactly what Jesus says. And Jesus says the reason he's doing this is so that you can understand what, is, what things are and what things are have been and what things will be hereafter. And, and, you're, and, and the intention is that it would open up things to you. But anyway, I've, I heard people say this before, especially you know, years ago, that this book is intentionally written in shadows and shades and figures that were highly Jewish because Jesus didn't want the Romans who were basically inspecting the writings of John as they went out, you know, from Patmos, kind of like a censor. Any of you, any of you have been in jail, and don't raise your hand because I know some of you, but if any of you have been in jail, and I know some of you have, um, that you wrote letters out to your loved ones, and they wrote stuff in, and somebody read it uh, before it went out, and then read stuff they sent back to you, and might have even censored some things that they didn't want you to say. Well, that's what ha was happening on the Isle of Patmos, as he was a prisoner of the Roman government, and uh, people speculated the reason the book of Revelation is so weird and crazy and has all these symbols and pictures is because the Jews could understand what those symbols meant, and the Romans couldn't understand, and so they let things slide past them because they didn't understand how really valuable. Now, I know that's a good theory, but that's 
crazy. That's not anything like what really happened. Jesus said it the way he said it so that it would be clear to us what he's talking about, not so it could be mysterious, not so it could be misunderstood. He said, I'm opening up. I'm revealing these things to you. And you who have ears to hear what the Spirit says, you're going to understand these things. The Spirit is going to translate it for you. The Spirit is going to speak to your heart. The Spirit is going to guide you into all understanding. And so what I'm saying to you is that God did not write a book to be intentionally confusing. God wrote a book to be opening and to be revealing, and he wants you to understand this, and you can understand this. I've got to get you to believe this. You can understand this. This is not going to be complicated. It's going to be opening. It's going to be revealing. And whereas something might have been shut up years before, like in the book of Daniel, there are prophecies in the book of Daniel that God speaks, and then he, he says uh, to, through the Holy Spirit, hey, uh, uh, shut these things up because this is not for now, and these people won't understand it. So seal them up. Shut them up, for they are for another time. Well, what was shut up in Daniel, what was shut up in Ezekiel, what was shut up in Isaiah, what was shut up in Zephaniah and Zechariah and Amos, what was shut up through all the Word of God up until the end is opened up in the book of Revelation. It's not intended to be uh, sealed and shut up. It's, in, it's intended for us to open them. And I'm just trying to encourage you that if you will come and you'll be involved and you'll listen and you'll hear what the Spirit says to you, that you can understand this, and God wants you to understand this, and his intention is that you understand this, and so here we go in what God has said. And so here's just a little, little jump off, and let's just get going. I'm going to go verse by verse. Everybody say verse by verse. You know what that means, right? That means I'm not skipping any verses. It means it might, you know, we might get 10 this week or 15 or 20 or 1. Okay. All right, here we go. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So the revelation is about Jesus. It's not about John. It's not about the Holy Spirit. It's not about any of that. This book is going, this book is re the revelation of Jesus. John did not have a vision. John did not eat bad mushrooms one night. He didn't, you know, go to sleep with a pizza on his belly and have these like uh, uh, nightmares and these kind of crazy visions. No, this is not caused by some hallucinogenic. This is, this is what Jesus Christ is saying. Not the acts of the apostles, not the acts of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of Jesus Christ himself. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. That word shortly is uh, the word in Greek, taku, which I know you can obviously think what that word translates in English. Yeah, you automobile folks, uh, tachometer comes from that word, which means uh, a tachometer is what? Something that measures velocity, right? And the higher it revs, the more velocity, the, 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 the quicker the needle reflects. That's a tachometer. It measures speed and velocity. Well, what that verse is saying is once these things come to pass, it does not mean that when John, Jesus says them that they're inherently quickly to come to pass. In other words, he's not saying, all right, once I say this to you, it's going to start happening right now. What he's saying is, once the things described in this book begin to happen, that they're going to move very quickly. So Jesus is saying, all right, get ready, get ready, get ready, because one of these days, the things I'm talking about are going to start happening, and once they start happening, get ready, because they're going to quickly move. They're going to keep moving fast. So the things which must shortly come to pass, and he sit and signified it by his angel to his servant John, so... Uh, the writer is John, uh, it goes on in verse 2, who bore witness of the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things that he saw. John, the same as the gospel of John, the same as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the one who didn't claim any authorship of any of the other writings. All the other writings, John just says, uh, this book is from him who Jesus loved. Might have been a little arrogant, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it appears to be humble, actually. You know, I mean, it's like John's not saying, I'm, I, John, am writing the Gospel of John, or I, John, am writing first, the letter 1 John, or 2 John, or 3 John. Uh, 
it's, it's, a, it's a humble act. It's, and John was a humble person. John, was a, John stayed back away from Jesus. You remember after, the, after uh, Jesus was resurrected, they met Jesus out by the ocean, and, and Jesus yelled out, Hey, have you caught anything? And all the guy says, No, no, no. And he says, Well, come on in. And they came on in, and they drug the net. And, and then Jesus, after they ate breakfast, he took Peter, and he was talking with Peter. And, Peter, and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah. And he said, well, feed my sheep. You know, that little conversation in John 21, if you want to look up it, look it up in your Bible with the pages in it. Um, look that one up. But it's a whole little conversation. And if you'll notice along about the end of, the, uh, the end of chapter 21, you'll see somebody standing at a distance way back there kind of following along behind Jesus and Peter, not nosing up in what they're doing, not getting close trying to overhear. He's just following at a distance as if, hey, I don't know, this may be the last time I see Jesus. I may never see him again, so I want to see him as long as I can. And the reason we know he was there is because when Jesus gets through telling Peter what Peter is going to do, Peter, follow me, uh, and there are going to be some guys that come get you one day, and they're going to do stuff you you don't want to have done, and they're going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. Now, knowing this, follow me. And then Peter does what Peter normally does. Peter looks around and he sees John at a distance and he says, and what about him? You said if I follow you, I'm going to die. What about him? And Jesus looked at him and said, what does it matter if I want him to live until I come again? You follow me. I'm not talking about what he needs to do. I'm talking about what you need to do. So that's, see, it's just like John to be humble and not to call attention to himself and it's just like Peter to, you know, ask about somebody else and all of that. And so anyway, John, this is John who is writing. So he, he's written John, Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. So it's about Jesus. John wrote it, and he wrote to all of us and says, You're blessed. Blessed are those who read and those who hear the words of the prophecy and those that keep the things which are written for the time is near. So there is a blessing pronounced to you if you hear this book, read this book, not just if you hear it. Now let me just say this to you. I know you're here, and I, I hope you're planning to be here every Sunday. If you do, you're going to hear read to you out loud the whole book. Well, we'll read every verse and everything in there. We're not dodging a thing, whether it hurts your feelings or not. All right, it hurts my feelings or not. But we're going to read it. But remember, I'm the one reading it. I'm going to read it to you. But it, it doesn't say, blessed is you who have this read to them. It says, you got to read it yourself. So what I'm saying to you is, though you may not be reading it right here, right now, you may or may not, you need to plan some way to read this book while we're in this book. You personally, get your Bible open. Open up your phone to a Bible website and actually read these words yourself. Because it says, blessed is he who reads these words and those who hear these words. Now, there's where you're going to be here and hear these words and hear what they are about and those who keep the things which are written. So every book of the Bible, don't get me wrong, every book of the Bible is a blessing of God. There are no books in the Bible that if you read them and obey them that would not be a blessing to you. But this is the only book who at the beginning of the book and the end of the book, do we have a verse in the book that says, you are blessed if you do these things. So see, it's no wonder that the enemy has convinced you to neglect the book of Revelation. I would venture to say that the most neglected book in the Bible is the book of Revelation, that there are probably less sermons, there are less uh, openings of the book. I mean, people talk about it. They mention it, but they never get into it because they're afraid or they don't think they can understand or they're, they don't want to get confused or it's too scary or whatever it might be. The enemy has, has run a campaign that's been very effective to keep us away from God's blessing in our life because God says this book is unique and he says it at the beginning, and he says it at the end, and he says, I'm going to bless you if you will read this book. And the devil says, ooh, it's too hard to understand. It's too scary. It's too whatever it is. And we go, yeah, you're right, devil. And so we have neglected the, the, the other 65 books, okay, we're good with, but the 66th book, 
who presents Jesus as the, as the conquering Lamb of God, the King of everything, the King of heaven, the King of earth, the King of ages, the King of judgment, the King of wrath, the King that is coming with a rod of iron. I mean, in all the other books, Jesus is the suffering servant, the neglected one, the rejected one, the beaten one, the destroyed one. In Revelation, he is the victorious one. He's bringing judgments against all of those who have beaten him and cursed him and spit upon him and rejected him and lied. And, and, and the devil says, you need to stay away from that book. And we all go, yeah, it's too, ooh, I wish we could understand it, but you know, we can't. And God says, look, get over that. You read this. You read it. I'll help you understand it because you're going to be blessed if you do this. So, so we're all blessed. He's saying the readers are blessed if you do it. And uh, the, John writes these letters, which we'll quickly come to in chapters 2 and 3 to Seven churches, and I'll say more about all of that. These are physical churches that are in Asia, and I'll have you a map up here in just a minute. These are actual real congregations, just like our congregation that would be sitting in church, hearing the Word of God, praying, doing the things that, that the churches do, and so forth. I mean, it's like real people. So uh, the writings, these, first, these writings are going to these seven churches. We'll talk all about that because there is a real reason for all of that. And... Uh, and the resources who this come from, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace and peace, from who, who's writing this, him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are, who are before his throne. Now, I just put Isaiah in there so you could see. You remember last week or a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the seven spirits. And if you're confused about that, no, there are not seven Holy Spirits. All right, he's not saying that this book is coming from seven Holy Spirits. He's talking about seven spirits. You say, what does that mean? Well, if you go to Isaiah 11, and you can go back and watch these things, and you can see uh, the passage. I read it out loud. I showed you each of the seven. This is just a description of the sevenfold character of God. Isaiah says, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And he names seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. So the seven spirits that are before the throne, along with the person who is speaking this, it's not seven Holy Spirits. It's a sevenfold nature of of one Holy Spirit, just like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is, not the fruits are. And then he gives nine characteristics. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So if you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be full of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But you're not going to just be filled with one of them like love. Oh, I want love, but that long-suffering, no, I don't want that. Or I want joy, but don't give me peace because that means I'm going to have to go through trouble. No, you're not getting one at a time. You're getting all of them. The fruit is singular. You either get one or you get none, you know. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Well, same kind of thing here. You have one Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, there's one Holy Spirit. But the character of the Holy Spirit manifests itself in seven ways. So he talks about all seven characteristic ways that the Holy Spirit manifests himself. This word is from Jesus Christ who was, who is, and who is to come, and from the complete, which is what seven means numerically. You're going to see seven a lot in the book of Revelation. The, word, the number seven is the number for completion, for perfection. It's God's number. On six days he created the earth. On the seventh day he rested. Why? Because it was complete and it's perfect. So when you see the number seven, if you want to just do a, an interpretation about, some, about a general thought, you can say, well, this is going to be talking about something that's complete, something that's full, something that's, uh, that's finished. Well, yeah, the Holy Spirit is finished. The Holy Spirit is complete. And so we see a seven, but, you know, you can, you can carry all that thought into the twilight zone if you want to. But he's talking about the sevenfold character um, uh, and, and the ruler and the firstborn from the dead and from Jesus Christ and faithful witness, firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood and he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So this letter is from whom? This letter is from the Father. This letter is from the Spirit. And this letter is from the Son. 
All right, that's all John is saying. Everybody in the Trinity is involved in this. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Still talking about Jesus, even though they, even, even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I'm Alpha and I'm Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come. I am the Almighty. Which basically, those verses are just simply a description of Jesus Christ. Jesus says he is the Alpha and he is the Omega. What is the Alpha? The Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. What is omega? Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. What is one of the major terms used for Jesus all the way throughout the New Testament? He is the Word of God, right? Well, how do you create words? You use alphabet. You use letters. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, I'm the Word of God. And not only am I the Word, I'm the holy alphabet of the Word. Let me just give you one little thought. In the book of 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul, writing to his young preacher boy, understudy in the ministry, Timothy, writes to Timothy in chapter 3, verse 15. He says, from, the, from a child, we have heard the holy scriptures, which are able to make us wise which lead us to understand Jesus Christ. In verse 16 said, and, 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 and the holy scriptures are profitable for us for righteousness, for instruction, for reproof, and correction in righteousness that we might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When he said in verse 15, from the beginning as a child we have known the holy scriptures. Let me just mention this to you. The word scriptures there is a translation of the Greek word grammata, which, can you guess what English word we would get from grammata? Grammar, how about that? But what is, what is Paul saying about, about Jesus? That he is actually uh, the letters of the alphabet. He is, he is not just a word. He is every letter that makes up every word. So the word of God is not just something that is inspired in concept are inspired in thought like many try to make it today. Well, God didn't actually dictate the Word of God. God didn't actually, you know, say, write the Word of... He just kind of inspired some thoughts out there, and people just wrote down what they thought he was saying. No, the, the Bible says that Jesus dictated not only the Word, but every letter of the alphabet that make up those words. And here Jesus is saying, you know what I am? I'm the beginning letter and I'm the ending letter. And I'm every letter in between. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the first and the last. I start stuff and I finish stuff. I don't just start things and let them go and don't finish them. So you can trust me because I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And, and, and John says, all right, that's who is talking to me. It's Jesus. Now let's just look at what he said. Beginning at verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Let me stop there for just a second. You have to admire humility. And John is a humble person, and this is one of the hum humble things that he said. You hear what he's saying? He said, look, let me tell you who I am. I am your brother. Now, you have to admire that because John could have said some highfalutin things about himself, right? He could have said, I, Dr. John. You know, I, Professor John, Dr. Bottle Stopper and Professor Whistlebritches and what I mean, you know, I, John, the great apostle of God, you know, the wizard of Oz. I, 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 am, I am John. You need to admire and respect me. You need to give me some dignity because I'm the big wheel in the cog. I'm the only one left. I mean, John could have gotten grandiose about who he was and all that, but look at the humility and that you have to admire this kind of attitude in somebody. He just said, call me, I'm Brother John. I'm just your brother. No claim to greatness and so forth. I'm just your brother, Brother John. And notice what he also says. He said, you know what I am? I'm your companion. A companion means one who stands alongside. A companion means a co-person. A, 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 in war time, it would mean somebody who stands back to back with you in battle. Uh, guys, your wives are, are your companion in life. That's what the Bible teaches. And ladies, your husband, your companion in life. 
which means you're on the same team, which means you stand back to back. It doesn't mean that you, one of you stands one way and the other one stands towards you, and when people try to kill you, they help them kill you. No, it means that no matter what happens, we are partners. We are companions. I got your back. You can count on me. I am with you. And you know what John says? John says, I'm your companion. I'm going to stand with you in the midst of everything. And what does he say? He said, there are three things that we're going through, and I'm your companion in. He said, I'm your companion in tribulation. What is tribulation? It's trouble. That's what it is. And so John says, look, you need to know I'm your brother, and I'm standing with you, and we're all going through tribulation. Well, was this true? Well, certainly it was true. Now, let me give you just a little bite of history. Is that, can you handle a little bite of history? Okay, I'm, I love history, and I'm apologize ahead of time. And I've asked Pastor Tanya, please don't let me get bogged down in history because I, I, the more history I, I, I become a part of, the more I like it. When I was young, I really didn't like history, but now that I'm a, a pretty good part of history, I, I, I seem to like it more, you know? <laughs> my, my grandchildren are now... Some of them have moved into high school, and they have projects on stuff like uh, the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Johnson, all these kind of things, all these. And if Papa, talk to us about this. Well, I don't have to open a book because I lived through it. I know exactly what was there. I know what happened and all that kind of stuff from a personal point of view. That's beside the point. But anyway... Um, Anyway, history. Let me just tell you that what this, uh, what, what's happening here, uh, the reason John is on the Isle of Patmos is because he's a political prisoner. And you say, what did he do wrong? Did he rob a bank? Did he kill somebody? You know, did, what, what happened to him? Well, I'll tell you what happened. John was an 86-year-old man. And you'll, I'll have some notes that'll have all this info in it in days to come for you because there'll be some more talk about this. But John's an 86-year-old man. Now, my question is, how fearful would a government have to be to be afraid of an 86-year-old man, you know? I mean, my goodness, John's not going to do a lot of physical damage to him, I don't think, do you? But he's an 86-year-old man, and, he's, and, he, and he, he says, I'm, I'm suffering right along with you. Well, why was he suffering? He was suffering because of the persecution that had come to the Christians of that day due to the insanity of the Roman government in those days. It started with the first Caesar, just as an example. The first Caesar was one, you'll recognize his name, Julius. Does anybody recognize Et tu Brute and all of that kind of stuff? Well, he was the first Caesar, and he was about 50 years roughly before Jesus was born. He started his Caesar reign. Well, all the Caesars, and I know many of you say, well, all of these guys were related to each other. No, they weren't. The Caesars were not brothers, and then the next one was the younger brother, and the next one was younger brother. They're not passing down like the Queen of England and all that. Poor, poor Philip, man. I don't think he's ever going to get to be king because I, I don't think Queen Elizabeth's ever going to go anywhere, you know. She's 93 years old, bless his Lord. He'll be, five, he'll be 90 when he gets to be. Anyway, but the point is, that's not what happened with the Caesars. The Caesars were not all related to each other. They were just all crazy, and the craziest one got to be the next one. And Julius was the first one, and when he died, he died in such a way that all the people of Rome said, he's a god. Well, then they began this thing of Caesar worship, which meant if you were a Caesar, you were God. And so the Romans began to require all the citizens, of which these Jews were some, to say Caesar is Lord and to burn incense to Caesar as if he's a god. Well, of course, the Christians wouldn't do this. The sincere Christians. Could anybody tell you to come by and, and say uh, Trump is Lord or Obama is Lord or Kennedy is Lord, you know, whatever it might be? No, why? Because we know Jesus is Lord. And so that's what happened to these Christians. They were being compelled to, de to declare that this Caesar was Lord. Well, Caesar, Julius Caesar passed away about the time, close to the time Jesus was born. And he was followed by a, a, another Caesar that you'll recognize his name because we read it in the Bible. Caesar Augustus was the next Caesar. And it was in Luke chapter 2 which says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, he passed a decree that all the world should be taxed. Well, that was Caesar Augustus. And he lived for a little while, and then he was followed by uh, a 
another Caesar, Tiberius, which was a great fighter and blah, blah, blah. Some of these guys were better than others. But then on down the line came people like Nero, who was a loon out there somewhere, and he, he fiddled while Rome burned and blah, blah. He was pervert from the word go. Everything he did was mentally, you know, collected. And then one really crazy one came along named Caligula. And Caligula was just, I mean, Caligula was evil, 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 but he was evil because he was mentally ill. It, I mean, he didn't even know wh what he was. I mean, he kind of ran around like an animal half the time and acted like a dog and blah. I mean, he was just out there in the twilight zone, and he did evil things because he was mentally ill. But then finally, the one who was the Caesar when John was uh, 86 years old that actually sent him out to the Isle of Patmos was one named Caesar Domitian. Now, Caesar Domitian was as crazy as Caligula. They, they really all were demon-possessed and crazy as a loon. Seriously, they would do weird stuff that I could embarrass all of you by telling you some of the stuff they did. It was just really crazy, perverted stuff. But, but uh, Domitian was not only crazy, he was evil also. And he did evil things, and he did horrible things because he was an evil person. And one of the things is he persecuted Christians tremendously. He put them in prison. He fed them to the lions. He sawed them asunder. He boiled them in hot oil. He set them on fire. He drove stakes through their heart. I mean, this was an evil person. And so John, saying to the rest of the Christians that he was writing to, I'm your brother. I'm your companion in tribulations. I want you to know, I know what it means to be in tribulation just like you do. We're right there together. We're companions in tribulation. And he said, we're also companions in two other things. We're all waiting on the kingdom of God, and we're all waiting with patience. So John says, look, hey, the one that's writing to you, the one that's writing to you is just like you, and I am your companion, and I am patiently waiting on the kingdom of God, and we're all suffering this stuff together. And then he goes, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The literal translation of that, I, and I'm not just trying to strain in a gnat and swallow a camel, but, but I want you to know the literal translation pattern of that scripture. When you read that, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. You said, all right, John woke up in church on Sunday morning. The Lord's day, you're interpreting and you're saying, I know what day that is. That's the day we go to church, the Lord's day. Well, you need to keep this in mind. First of all, the Jewish people, the, the day they worshiped was on Saturday, not Sunday. The Jews worshiped on the seventh day of the week, the seventh day of the week is Saturday, not Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. You say, well, why in the world do we Christians worship on the first day of the week, not the last day of the week? Well, it's in honor of Christ. Jesus Christ rose from the grave on first fruits, which happened on the first day of the week following Passover, which means Passover happened the week Jesus was crucified. So the following Monday, the first day of the week, was the day they walked up there with all the spices and ointments and they found the stone rolled away. And the angel said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen, just like he said. Go back and tell Peter and the boys to meet him in Jerusalem, just like they talked about. Well, that was the first day of the week. So you say, why do we Christians worship on the first day of the week? It's because our Savior rose on the first day of the week. So the first day of the week to us is sacred because it reflects that's the day Jesus rose from the dead and completed what our hope and our faith demands for our own life. Now, you might be saying, well, okay, that means that John was in church on the Lord's day. But the literal reading of, uh, you know, I love John's spirit. I love the spirit of God. Notice, although he was banished to an isle where he was imprisoned, no doubt that Patmos was a prison isle. It was a, it was a piece of volcanic rock about 35 miles south of Sicily. And I'll have a little map, and I'll let you get a picture in just a second of it because uh, I just clipped one for you so you could kind of get an idea of what it looked like. But it, was, it had, like, mines, and it had little uh, holes and crevices, and these people had to work. And, I mean, it was a, it was a barren, volcanic piece of rock that was sent there for punch. It, it would make Alcatraz look like Howard Johnson's, if that would give you any kind of idea about that. But, but anyway, it, he, he, was, he was sent there to be punished, and so he said, all right, uh, I, was, I was, even though my body was bound, my spirit was free. Now, you need to grab on to that right there. 
Because there may come a time where we find ourselves in bondage. I'm not trying to scare. Look at your neighbor and say, don't get scared. All right, don't get scared. I'm, I'm just saying to you that, 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 that our bodies can be bound, but our spirits can be free. And John says, even though I was in, on, on a prison aisle and I was in a, you know, they were working me and I couldn't get off and I was in bondage physically, my spirit was free. And he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In other words, he said, I was, I was, I was worshiping the Lord. I was experiencing the day of the Lord. Let me, let me just say it that way. I was experiencing the day of the Lord, which the day of the Lord could be what? Any day, right? If the Lord lives in your heart and the Holy Spirit is free in you, what day, what day is the Lord's day? Well, I'm going to tell you what day the Lord's day is to me. Any day. Every day is the Lord's day. And so it's not necessarily that John was on Sunday in a church service saying, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. No, I was experiencing the Lord's day is what John says. So it could have been any day. So it, 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 the, the point is that, that he was in the Spirit and the Lord was communing with him. And notice what happened. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now that doesn't say he heard behind him a trumpet. It said he heard a loud voice that sounded like a, like a trumpet. Well, what did this voice sound like? Well, it was just like I told you a moment ago. There's a trumpet. There's a shofar of God. And no matter, I'm telling you, uh, like I mentioned before the service started, I don't care how loud this band plays. This band can play so loud that your ears will be bleeding. Some of you may be experiencing that. So <laughs> your ears might be bleeding. Well, we're doing it for your safety. That way you can't hear the person beside you sing. So it's for your protection that we play it that loud. Uh, anyway, everybody go, ooh, naughty pastor. Yeah, bad pastor. All right, well, anyway. Anyway, so, you're, so, so what that means is that, that, that the voice sounded like a trumpet, and the voice was speaking. So it, the, no matter what was going on, the voice, the voice pierced through what was being said so that John, John could hear it. And, and, and so John hears this voice that, that sounds like a trumpet. And, and, and what, did this, what did this trumpet say to him? Well, this trumpet-like voice began to speak. There's the Isle of Patmos. I just put it in there for you. There's a, good, there's a picture of it. If you can see that rocky little volcanic mountainous looking deal right there. Uh, it's just a rendition of it. Nothing, no beauty, no vegetation, very little vegetation, just a hot, rocky little crag out in the Aegean Sea. But here's what the voice was saying to him. He was saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. So when John turns around to see this voice that is speaking to him, this voice says something to him. This voice says, I'm Alpha and Omega. Now let me ask you, who is the voice that is speaking to him? Well, you already know who the voice is because you've already seen someone in verse 8 that said, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. I am the one who was and who is and who will be. Who is that, by the way? That is Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm the first and the last. Let me give you one, one way that you can interpret Scripture, and I know you're going to have to do this all the way through the book of Revelation. Let the book interpret the book. I mean, you know, it's really easy. It's a principle called synthesis. When you are trying to translate something that you're a little confused about or you don't know what certain things are, look at what they were before. Look at, say, have I ever seen that before? Well, sure, I saw that just a few verses before. Well, who was it before when he was identified? He said, I'm the first and the last. I'm him who was, who is, who is to come. Uh, I'm Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know. Well, all right, so now he says uh, when the one behind me uh, said something to him and the one behind him said that sat, had this big trumpet-like voice said, I'm Alpha Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches. Now, let me just say this to you because uh, you need to understand this. In the book of Revelation, there are, um, let's just say, Let's, let's call them divisions, all right, Let, for lack of a better way to talk about this. Let's just say there are divisions in this book. By, by divisions, I mean a lot of times, you know, when we think of the book, we're thinking of John sitting down on some rock somewhere 
And, and God starts speaking to him, and he starts writing, 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 and, 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 he, and, he, and he goes through the whole book, and then John quits. But we don't really know for sure how long it took for this to be given to John, because it doesn't say, and on the next day, or on the third day, or something like that. It just starts talking about these, these different visions. Well, one of the visions, he's sitting on the Isle of Patmos, and then maybe two chapters later it says, and the angel said, come up hither, and then he took him up to heaven, and then he start, showed him something from heaven. And then about maybe a chapter or two later it said, and I, John, was in the spirit and blah, blah, and that, well, and so what you're getting is you're getting the understanding that there are like, okay, this vision came from here, and then God moved him over to here and gave him a vision from here. Then God moved him up here and gave him a vision from here. And, yeah, and, and I'm just saying that there are about 12 different views as, he, as we move through Revelation. Now, I, I know, is that confusing? I mean, does that, does that make any sense to you? And you go, why do I need to know that? Well, you need to know it because what I'm about to tell you is important. Because it just shows you how the Spirit of God does things. There are, there are uh, according to most uh, theologians who study the book of Revelation, do you know that there are people that have studied this book their entire life and they lived and died based on this book? I mean, there are people that have given their life and the Spirit of God has led them to do understandings. And people like me come along and study what they wrote and then hear, the God, hear God speak to, to their heart and, and benefit from what others have given their life to study and prepare. And so I, I try to be responsive to those kind of things and ask the Lord and, and read and try to prepare myself so that I can synthesize all that and, and help all of us get the real true word. Well, well, there, there seem to be about 12, about 12 divisions of the book. Not just one continuous story, but 12 aspects. 12, like, okay, the, this changed from there to here. The location moved from here to here. Uh, what was seen is seen from this point of view, and then that one was seen from that point of view. So there are about 12 of these. And I'm just telling you this because in 11 of the 12, notice what this says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. That 11 of the 12 times, the 12 divisions, what is seen by John, the angel or Jesus says to him, write this down and send it to them so they can see it. There is only one time, only one division of the... Of the 12 divisions, only one time out of 12 does, the, does, does, does Jesus say, uh, don't write this down. Seal this up. And it happens in Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, what you have going on, I don't mean to add another little level of confusion, but we'll get there, believe me, verse by verse. But in Revelation chapter 10, you have the judgment of, of the, of the Gentiles, the judgment of the nations. What that means is, in Revelation chapter 10, it's a great scene of the judgment of people who are lost, people who don't know the Lord, nations who have dishonored the Lord. They get their comeuppance. You know, one of these days, there's going to be a payday. You make no mistake about it now. You may be fat, happy, and sassy right now, you maybe think you're getting away with murder and life and do everything you want to, but I'm just telling you there's a payday to come. And in, this, in Revelation chapter 10, it describes this. There have been the breaking of, some, uh, of, of seven seals, and then there's the, breaking, the sounding of six, seven trumpets, and then on the sixth trumpet, and this will all make sense. Don't get confused with all that. I'm just going through it to show you the pattern. At the, break, at the sounding of the sixth trumpet, all of a sudden, uh, Jesus steps out of heaven with a scroll in his hand. And this scroll is the title deed of the earth. It gives Jesus the authority over the earth. And he steps out of heaven with the title deed of heaven in his hand, and he puts one foot on the sea, and he puts one foot on the earth to show that he is Lord of the earth and the sea, 
and that he has the authority to judge the whole earth, and all of a sudden, lightnings and thunderings and judgment and all begin to come against all of the earth and everybody that has rejected him and those who are not saved and don't know the Lord, and it's such a horrible scene. It's such a devastatingly terrible event that happens that the Spirit says, don't write this. Don't, don't tell them about this. This is just too bad. This is just, this is not something, hey, let's just pass this on by. And out of the, uh, out of the 12 scenes where the Spirit says, write this down and show it to them, it's the only one. He says, seal this up. Uh, it's too bad. It's too, too tough, too tough. But on this one, he says, write these down, send them to the seven churches. Then he names them Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, just to show them to you on a map, there you go. If you'll notice, if you start with, uh, if you start with Ephesus right here, and you go Smyrna, you go up so out Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. There's the Isle of Patmos sitting out in the middle of the Aegean Sea. You kind of, kind of, I mean, if you start at the bottom and you move around, you have more or less a circular pattern as it, it, he writes and those are seven real churches and we'll look at everything about all of those because the next two chapters are about that and he's written them and he's written them certain things and what the spirit has said he's going to say write these things down and send them and so and so he did he writes them down he sends them to the seven churches and, um, and we'll read about what he said. Now, let me just give you a, couple, a few closing things, okay? Are, are you with me? Is this too much? All right, just a quick, quick now, so don't, don't get all panicky. I'm not getting out. Uh, we're not, I do know the Presbyterians have beaten us so, to the chicken house, so that's what we're going to have to say. All right, verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. So he heard this voice that sounded like a trumpet, and this voice said, Write these things down. And so John turns to see, All right, who is it that is talking to me? And when he turns to see, he says, And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, I know you're sitting here going, Man, seven golden lampstands, what a weird something to see. Well, you're going to be asking yourself, what are these lampstands? Well, the Bible is going to tell you what these lampstands are in the last verse of this chapter. In verse 20 of chapter 1, John's going to say, the, the lampstands that you saw are the seven churches, and the stars in the right hand of Jesus are the angels, or the pastors, the messengers, sent by God to these seven churches. So we're going to let Revelation interpret Revelation. We're not going out in a twilight zone somewhere to try to drag something in about what this means. We're going to let the Bible tell us what it means. And in verse 20 it says, let me tell you what it means. When you turn around and standing in the midst of these golden lampstands, gold is precious, gold is majestic, gold is kingly, there, these seven lampstands represent seven churches. And the stars are the seven pastors that, that speak the word of God to these seven churches. Now, ju just a couple of thoughts here just for you to kind of get in the flow of thinking. Um, what, what is a lampstand? Well, I mean, you can see here, I mean, maybe not really well, but you can see what a lampstand is. A lampstand is basically an instrument in which it has a bowl, and this bowl has oil in it, and then the bowl has an, a wick that comes down in it, and then you light the wick, and it gives off light. So what is a lampstand used for? A lampstand is used to give light, right? And a lampstand cannot give light on its own. It can only burn because of what is inside the oil. So in other words, a lampstand is something that reflects something that it is filled with. So what is the purpose of a lampstand? To shine light into dark places. What is the purpose of a church? The purpose of a church is to shine light into darkness. And can the church shine light on its own? No, we can only shine when we are filled with something that we cannot provide for ourselves, but when the Lord fills us with himself, then we can reflect what our bowls are full of. And so John says, when I turned around, there was Jesus standing in the midst of these seven lampstands, 
that are the seven churches. And I'm encouraged. Now, listen, I'm encouraged that Jesus is standing in the midst of these lampstands. You know why? Because that means he's still with us. That means that no matter what we might think about our church or any church anywhere or the church age or how evil or negative or whatever it might be, the point is in the future when everything begins to come together and there begins to move all of these things on the earth, Jesus is still with us. Say, that's good news. <laughs> Jesus is still in the midst of us. He didn't forsake us. He hadn't left us. He's not standing outside judging us. He's right there still in the midst of us. And so Jesus says, uh, uh, John said, all right, I turned around to look at this trumpet-like voice that said I'm Alpha and Omega, and I saw, I saw, I saw uh, that voice standing in the midst of the golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man said, man, that thing looked like the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a gold band. I just kind of put a little artist rec rem uh, rendition up here. I, you know, just kind of put a little thought in your mind. But the only thing I want to mention here is that when, 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 when he looked and he saw, he saw standing in the middle of all of these lamps in the seven churches, he said, I saw one, and here's what he was dressed in. And, and here's why it's important about the dress. Notice what he said. He, was, he said he had a robe on that went from his, from his head to his feet. Now, you need to know this because this is saying something specific about the one who's standing in the midst of the lampstands, about Jesus. A robe that went from the head to the feet was a robe of authority because common people did not wear a robe that went from the head to the feet. Common people wore a robe that went from the head down below the knees. Why? Because common people had to work. Common people could not have a robe that went all the way to the ground because it would restrict them in what they had to do in their labor. So when you see someone dressed in a robe that went from his head to his feet, that spoke to you and said, this person has authority. This person is not a common worker. This person, there were three kinds of people that, that wore robes from their head to the feet, and this is true in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, so here's what this is saying. When, I, when John said, when I looked around and I saw him and he was dressed, he was dressed in a robe of authority, which said to me, and then he had that golden sash around his breast, which really made it more regal and royal than anything. Kings wore robes that went from the head to the feet. Priests wore robes that went from the head to the feet. Prophets wore a robe that went to the head to the feet. What is this saying about the one who is speaking? The one who is speaking is a, a prophet, a priest, and a king. I know you're going, oh, wow, that's really important. Well, listen, I mean, think about what it's saying to you. The one who is speaking to John, who's standing in the midst of the churches, is dressed a certain way so that you can recognize what his position is. His position is he's a king. He's the king of kings. He's the king of the nations. He's the king of the earth. He's the king of the world. You know, he's the king. But he's not only a king, he's a prophet. What does a prophet do? A prophet is one who speaks to the people from God. God gives the prophet a word, and the prophet says, here's what God says to the people. And he's dressed as a priest. What does a priest do? A priest hear what the people say and talk to God for the people. So what is this saying about the guy that's standing in the midst of the churches and talking? He is a prophet, he's a priest, and he's a king. He fulfills all of these earthly positions where before, I mean, he's not only the king of kings and filled with glory as the gold transmits and so forth. He also fulfills the priest because he's the one who hears what we say and tells God. And he's the prophet. He hears what God says and tells us. The one thing about Jesus that's so mysterious, folks, is how can Jesus be everything to us? Well, the Bible tells us that he's the perfect God-man. And I know that may sound weird, and you're going, oh, that sounds like some preacher double talk. Well, all that simply means is that Jesus was as much, and, and, and Pastor Wesley mentioned this last week, if I'm not mistaken, that Jesus was as much man as if he was not God at all. Jesus got tired. Jesus got hungry. Jesus was weary. Jesus was beaten down. Jesus, you know, uh, sweat dropped blood out of him. I mean, Jesus did perfectly human things. When Jesus was on this earth, he was as much man as if he was not God at all. 
Yet on the other hand, he was as much God as if he was not man at all. Jesus walked on water, spoke to the wind, spoke to the... I mean, he performed miracles. He was as much God as if he was not man at all. He was as much man as if he was not God at all. What was he? Well, this is a mysterious thing. Jesus was the God-man, the perfect God and the perfect man. And he could make intercession for us because he was like a priest and spoke to God for us. And he was like a prophet. He spoke to God, uh, uh, spoke to God down to us. And he's the king. And so John says, I just want you to know that when I turned around and I heard this trumpet-like voice, what I saw standing in the middle of all of those churches that represent back there is I saw one who represents the prophet, the priest, and the king, which, by the way, is what Isaiah said would happen. Isaiah said, for un Isaiah said you know how you're going to recognize the Messiah? He's going to be the prophet, the priest, and the king. You know where he said it? He said, for unto you is born one who bears the government on his shoulder. And unto, him, unto, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And unto us is one who shall bear the government on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting. And of his peace and increase there shall be no end. And the government shall ride upon him and the church shall ride upon him. I'm just telling you that God never misses a trick and he told us what was going to happen. And John said, I just want you to know, when I looked around, I saw this guy. That's who I saw. And, and he said, and that's the way he looked and it testified to me. And his head and his hair were white like wool as white as snow, which means wisdom. The uh, book of Proverbs says that the white hair, uh, the old King James word is hoary, H-O-R-Y, which don't think something ugly about that. It just means white-headed. And when you're white-headed, Proverbs says you're wise. I mean, we know that's not true, but that's what <laughs> Proverbs says. When you're bald-headed, that's when you're wise, not when you're... Wise. But anyway... So this is something, this is filled with the wisdom of God as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. The word used there is a penetrating flame. Like when he looks at you, his eyes just penetrate you. It, does, it, it means that he knows you. It means he sees you. Look, other people may judge you by innuendo. Other people may judge you by jealousy. Other people may judge you by hearsay, by what somebody told them, about what somebody said, about what they saw on Facebook or something like that, this, this is a piercing judgment. In other words, it's like he can look right through you and see the real you. And I'm going to tell you, you stand before the Lord one day, you're not going to be judged by somebody who's making up stuff about you or who doesn't really know the truth about you. According to this, his eyes are like a piercing flame of fire who looks into your soul and sees the real you like you really are. And John said, man, I'm going to tell you, his hair was white as wool. Uh, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass if it was re uh, refined in a furnace, which anytime you see brass or bronze in the Scripture, it stands for judgment. So because he has brass feet, bronze, actually bronze would be a better word for it, bronze feet, it means that this is a judging Christ. This is not a compassionate Christ. This is not a uh, Christ of salvation. This is a judgment Christ. This is Christ who is sent to bring judgment against those who have rejected him forever and ever. And, and notice how his voice, and his voice as the sound of many waters. How many of you here were during Katrina? Were any, any of you guys stuck around during Katrina? I was here during Katrina for 12 hours. You want to know how it sounded? For 12 hours, it went... It was blowing so hard that it was a rumble, like... And then it was blowing so fast that you could hear the wind whistling. It was like... 12 hours that every once in a while... How's going? I'm thinking... There's no place like home. There's no place. <laughs> I'm thinking Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I'm just saying, you know what John's saying? John said, uh, like a thousand Katrinas. His voice sounded like a thousand Katrinas. Man, it was just overwhelming, the voice of sound of many waters. I mean, it was blowing. And he had in his right hand seven stars. 
Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged. Those seven stars, by the way, verse 20 will say, are the pastors of the churches. I just want you to know that because I've been telling you I'm a star. I just, everybody says, pastor's a star. Okay, I, I just want you to know it because, see, you think these athletes are stars. You think these musicians are stars. You think these, no, no, no I'm telling you, I'm a star. <laughs> don't, don't think too highly of that. All right. He had his right hand, seven stars, which verse 20 says are the messengers to the churches, are the pastors, are the ones who bring the revelation of Christ to the church. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. I put in your notes like Mel Gibson on Braveheart. <laughs> not a little, this is not a little fencing sword. This is a judgment sword. This is the kind of sword you cut somebody's head off with. This is a double-sided sword that's really too heavy to carry into battle because, I mean, unless you're, you know, like the Incredible Hulk or somebody, Goldberg, somebody like that. I mean, you got to, you know, this is, this is sharp on both sides and is used to execute people. And so John said, I saw him, and, man, he had an executioner's sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. John said uh, he was so bright you couldn't even look at him. It was like, like trying to look into the sun. And notice what John says he did when he saw this. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. John said, man, I knew Jesus. I laid my head on Jesus' breast. Jesus was my friend. I loved Jesus. But this Jesus, when I saw him and his hair was like wool and his feet like burnished brass and he was so bright I couldn't even look at him and his voice was so loud it sounded like a thousand Katrinas looking at me and his eyes pierced right through me and that sword was raised over him and, and I loved Jesus. I laid my head on Jesus' breast. I said, I'm the one who Jesus loves. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man which ought to give you a testimony of how awesome this view of Christ is going to be. John said, man, he overwhelmed me, boy. And Jesus had to reach down, notice, and he laid his hand on me. And he said, come on, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. In other words, John, I started all this stuff out. And you know what? I'm going to be here when it's over. I'm not going to leave you, buddy. Come on, stand up. I got you. I got the first. I'm not the first, and then I left you. I'm the first, and I'm the last. Look at what else he says. I'm he who lives. That means I've conquered. I've overcome. I'm not dead and was dead. In other words, I'm him who was alive, and they killed him who was alive. But I didn't stay dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. The word used there is Hades, which means the place of the departed wicked. It means the place where people who don't know the Lord go when they die to be punished forever. Jesus said, I'm the authority over death, and I'm the authority over the punishment of death. I'm the captain. I have the keys. And I have the keys of death and hell. So I have the authority over death. I have the authority over the dungeon. I have the authority over hell. Write these things which you have seen. There's your natural outline. The things which are the things which shall take place. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand are the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw were the seven churches. All right. So there's the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Everybody still alive? All right. Yeah, everybody's still alive. All right, stand up to your feet.